Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump, uh, the weekly show in which we have a conversation with someone who has had a spiritual awakening. My name is Rick Archer and my guest tonight is John Spear. And in a minute, John will introduce himself and give us a little biography of uh, his life and interests. Uh, but before he does that, I would like to make a, a few brief comments as I sometimes do. I just want to say that um, this show is, well, first of all, I want to say that they're practicing hair in the next room, and you might hear uh, Age of Aquarius coming through in the background. But aside from that, this show is totally unscripted. Uh, I don't plan out questions ahead of time. I generally don't have any extensive conversation with my guests about what we're going to talk about. It's extemporaneous. We just wing it. And on the other side of it, uh, it is unedited. After the show has been taped, uh, we slap titles on at the beginning and end and basically air it as it is uh, without any editing. And that being the case, I often think back to things I have said uh, uh, in certain interviews that I, you know, I wish I had phrased them differently or it's, I you know, my, my statements might be misconstrued. And last, night, last week in particular, I was making some comments about uh, Ramana Maharshi and uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj and uh, Ramesh Balsakar which I stopped myself because what I was saying was coming out sounding derogatory, at least to my ear. And I just want to say that I had no intention of sounding that way, and I have the utmost respect for those teachers. And uh, what I was actually trying to say is that I found better words for it in the subsequent week because I've been listening to an interview series called The, the Great Integral Awakening, hosted by a man named Craig Hamilton. And his contention, uh, and that of some of the people he's studied under, is that uh, not only the expression of, of enlightenment evolves as the culture evolves, you know, from 2,000 years ago or whatever to the present, but the actual experience of enlightenment evolves because we are evolving beings and our ability to fathom and reflect uh, these spiritual or deeper realities that we've been discussing, discussing is actually in a continual state of development. And that's actually what I was trying to say when I was making comments about those teachers and uh, didn't mean anything derogatory. So, having covered my bases on that, I'd like to get to tonight's interview and introduce uh, our guest, John Spear. <clears throat> and I know a little bit about John, but I think I'll just ask him to uh, tell us about whatever he considers relevant and significant about his, uh, his life, what, what you do, where you're from, you know, your interests, your family, all that kind of stuff. Sure. First of all, I want to say into the camera that this is for my children for Eve, Matt, Bethany, um, because uh, I feel like uh, I want them to, to hear this part of me. I want them to see in detail what, uh, what this was. Um, I'll give you a DVD when we're done. You can thank you. Take yeah, it home. yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so, and the other thing is that I never considered what happened or what has been happening to me in my spiritual evolution to be a spiritual awakening. I mean, that's, that's a word that I just haven't ever used. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but I mean, but, but I do know that what has happened to me from time to time has been, I've had some really wonderful uh, experiences for which I'm very, very grateful mm -hmm. uh, because they've helped me to understand my life, understand, you know, give more, uh, what do you call that, more um, uh, meaning to, to things that have happened in my, in my life. Good. Uh, and the kids know some of this, but uh, I've never told it, you know, in a, in a, interview situation where I could kind of put it together. Yeah. I'm sure it, almost most of your interviewees have felt the same way. For the most part. I mean, some people have been very quiet about it. Uh, you know, there's a mutual friend of ours who more or less came out of the closet here, you know, a, about a month ago when I, when I interviewed him. He'd never really talked about it in public, and he decided that now was the time, and he wanted to explain what had happened to him. Excellent. Yeah. And yeah. when you asked me to do this, I was thinking, I wasn't even sure what it meant. <laughs> um, <laughs> But anyway, to just tell you something about myself, because my kids know me, but maybe you don't know this part about my life. But uh, I was born in East Cleveland, Ohio, um, in right near where um, the Kirtland, the Mormon Kirtland Temple is. And uh, it's uh, um, in the hospital there, but my father was teaching in a, in a school in Lakewood, mm -hmm. in, in Lakewood, uh, Ohio, near Cleveland, uh, the west side of Cleveland. And, then uh, that's where I, I lived most of my life in, in Ohio until I, um, I became, first of all, 
Well, actually, I should go because you can see this. You can see this is a script because I'm going to be going all around trying to figure out, you know, where the, where this is going because because it is it does unfold a little. So if mm -hmm. I talk too much, just say, you know, move it. I might move interject it a question yeah, here right. and there. Move it along. Move yeah. it along. But we've got a caller. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. So, but my. But I just, from the very earliest age, I knew that I wanted to know what my life was about. I wanted to know, I of course wouldn't have called it consciousness back then, mm -hmm. when I was a kid, but I wanted to know what life was. What, was. what did it mean to be alive? And I would think about this to the point of uh, terror. And where at what I would, age? At about nine. Nine, okay. I mean, before that, but I mean, the, the, the terror attacks started coming about nine, about nine years old. Huh. And what would happen was, I say terror attacks, they weren't, you know. Yeah. Well, I'll explain it, what it was. And most of you, if, if you are watching this and have had any experiences like this, you'll probably realize they were much more innocent than what I thought they were as a child. But when I was a child, and my father took a golfing, or took, I, I caddied for my father who was, went golfing one day with his friends. <laughs> And I walked into the clubhouse and I started thinking this thought that I thought over and over again. And the thought was just, am I really here? Or is either, am I really here? Or is this really happening? Uh -huh. And happening meaning, am I alive, really? Mm. And I didn't really think that way. Or is my, it all a dream? Is is it, it, yeah, well, is it, all, yeah, is it all a dream? Is it, uh, no, I actually thought, is this really happening? Huh. I mean, as I, and I thought, like, like right now, I wouldn't do it. I, <laughs> something may happen, I don't know. But I would think, is this really happening? Is this really happening? Am I really here? I, is, is this happening? I would do that. And then all of a sudden, I was looking at the towels, and all of a sudden the towels were, I, I, I mean, I wasn't there. And it wasn't happening. Huh. And yet, it was happening. And I knew that it was happening. And I thought, I better get back to where it's really happening, or I'm going to. So I just got really I, I, I just started running and saying, um, I didn't scream or anything, but it's like, like trying to go like f either with my mouth saying, oh God, or God, or just hitting myself, not hitting myself, I wouldn't do that, yeah. but just somehow jarring myself back into a reality. Hmm. I have that experience all the time, by the way, but I like it. <laughs> Yeah, right, that's what everybody tells me now. John, you're just, you, know, you should have just, well, my, my, my dear friend, Robert Bailey, um, when I told him this before, before as, as my dear friend, uh -huh. he said, John, next time that happens, you just sit back and go, okay, what are you going to teach me? You know, yeah. as a nine-year-old child, no, I didn't want any part of this. Right. I thought, this is too weird, too, and, I, and so, but it would happen, like, quite often. Mm -hmm. My parents would take me to the doctor, and he'd say, no, there's nothing wrong with him, he's fine. And so I just had to live with this until I, um, and then when I became about 13 or 14 or 15, somewhere around there, um, I went to a Youth for Christ rally in Akron, Ohio. And they said, if you truly believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, then we invite you to come forward. And I took it as a sort of a thank you thing. So I would say, thank you to Jesus for dying for you. Okay, I'll come forward. <laughs> so I walked down this, this huge Akron Civic Auditorium with all these, uh, with all these uh, born-again born Christians. And uh, I went down and accepted Christ as my Savior. Uh -huh. This is October 12th, 1969, the day I was saved. The day after my birthday. Really? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, so I went down and they took me to a little room and they said, well, this, now you're a Christian. I said, oh, okay. And I started going to this Baptist church. And I loved it. I loved being a Baptist, and I, I loved uh, going to these things, and um, I loved uh, the whole, the whole born-again Christian thing. Well, as I got older, I met some Mormons, mm -hmm. and I started reading uh, the Book of Mormon, and I was, th I was thinking, then I thought, well, it, it talked about Christ coming to America. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I can believe this, that Christ taught here, and he taught there, so I became a Mormon mm -hmm. when I was about 18, 19, and then I... Uh, to make a long story very short, went on a mission, married a Mormon, raised my children in the Mormon church, and, uh, and loved every minute of it. I think uh, uh, between Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith, I felt like my spiritual needs and my, sp my need for spiritual philosophy and, and, and for answers to the questions of why are we here, where are we go, you know, why are we here, or who are we, why are we here, who am I, why am I here, um, where am I going after this life, that sort of thing. I felt that those are answered very well. Um, and then um, I started doing something called life coaching. Mm -hmm. And I, so I would talk to people about things that they needed in their life, uh, things that, that would help them become better at whatever it was they were doing. I would coach CEOs of companies, vice presidents of companies, things like that. Um, and then I, in and, and, and trying to figure out what these people wanted, I came to the conclusion that what most people want in life, whether they say they want a car or they want to be the president of their company, they want to be promoted, they want a million dollars, whatever it is, 
I, I, I somehow got them to understand, I'm not sure wh how this evolved, but, but I got them to understand that that wasn't what they wanted. Mm -hmm. What they really wanted was the feeling behind all that. They wanted to feel, and I, and I, and I came up with something um, that uh, it was, I, I drew a circle for them, and the middle of the circle was, was uh, joy, mm -hmm. or, or success, or whatever you want to call it, whatever that thing was that they wanted to get to. And I, and I figured out that what most people want in their life was to feel unique, to feel, uh, to feel destined, that there's a mm. sense, of, sense of destiny to their life. And this is the upper part of the circle. If you have, you, uh, you have a, a sense of destiny and a sense of competence mm. in, the, in the upper part, that I'm competent, that I can support my family, that I'm destined to do it, that I'm uniquely qualified to do it. And that gives people a sense of utter ex exhilaration. And so when you see a, a football player that's going to the end of the uh, line and he, and he makes a touchdown, he's like this, he's just really excited. He's just, yeah. could be because he was competent and he was destined to, to do that, mm -hmm. okay? That gives you that feeling. And then I said to these, then I taught these, these people that were my clients, I said, but you also have in the l lower part of the circle that sense of love and belonging mm -hmm. and that sense of mm -hmm. worthiness. In other words, you keep the rules that you've been given. Mm -hmm. Um, and the sense of love, you belong to a wife, children, you have, or just people like you and, and love you, and you love them. There's that, and that gives a sense, sort of a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. So you have this exhilaration and this peace, and you put them together, and I called that joy. Mm -hmm. It may be called bliss, I don't know what, but that, that's, I told people that's what they're really after. And if you can get part of it by getting a car, which makes you feel competent, and makes you feel good about yourself, that's part of it. But you've got to have it all. So. <laughs> I started reading people who might be teaching that. One of the people that I read was Stephen R. Covey, mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the people that I read was um, Deepak Chopra. Mm -hmm. Well, Deepak Chopra said, and I loved Deepak Chopra, I still do, but he said in his writings, all of them, my teacher was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and I'd heard of him from the Beatles. And, and, and so, I, so I knew him, but I thought, well, if this is what, if, if Maharshi Mahesh Yogi is teaching this man these wonderful truths, then I want to know it all. I want to know everything he's teaching. So I kind of said, and I, and I took upper, upper right, I said, <laughs> up to the upper right, I said these words, I shall go to, that, to the place where they're teaching what this man is teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and I was at that time trying to get a doctorate in, in intrapersonal communication. Mm -hmm. Um, it, the self-communicating with the self. Because I felt that that's really where it was at. That with intrapersonal. The, intrapersonal. Because uh -huh. I have a degree in uh, interpersonal communication, a uh -huh. degree in, 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 uh, in mass communication, uh -huh. and I wanted my third my doctorate to be in, in, uh, in intrapersonal, the self-communicating you know, with the self. Yeah. yeah. So, I, and so in studying that, and in studying for helping people in my, in my business, my consulting business, I, uh, I studied this, this man who mm -hmm. led me to Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I said that, and about six months later, uh, somewhere three to six months later, I get a call from a man who lives in town here named Stephen Wynn. Mm -hmm. Who was on this show. Yeah, I yeah. understand. Yeah. Um, so and Stephen mm -hmm. called me and said, uh, would you please come out where, where some people had recommended you to start a coaching program for our company. For, mm -hmm. um, it was called Home Business Technologies. So I flew out here. And uh, they, and, and in the limousine on the way from the airport, um, a guy in the back of the limousine—it was like a, you know, like a, a van—and mm -hmm. and so in the back of the limit, in, in the back seat, this guy said, "Would you mind if I meditated?" And I said, "Knock yourself out." <laughs> so, no clue what he was talking about. I thought he was going to light candles in the back seat and start doing some, you know, weird stuff. So, so, <laughs> so, so I said, "Okay, whatever." And I just went on talking to the guy and. Um, well, actually, I, was, I, I think I was a little more polite than I think we were quiet. Yeah. yeah but, but after about 20 minutes, it was over, and I just did, I said, that was it? <laughs> that, was, that was your meditation? I turned around to him, and he said, don't you know where you're going to? And, and I said... Uh, he, who said that? Uh, uh, the guy that was meditating. I he don't said, know who it was. He said that to you? To don't, me. Don't you know where you're don't going? Don't you know where you're going? Because uh, uh, I, I didn't have any clue right, where I was right. going. And he said, well, this is the, the home of transcendental meditation. And I said, well, transcendental meditation, do you mean the Maharshi Mahesh Yogi? And he said, yes. I said, oh my gosh, that's where I said I wanted to go. <laughs> that's where I wanted to go. And here I am going there. Yeah, interesting. So I, yeah, so I went there and, I, and, I, and the first thing that I did, just to tell you about how this evolves. The this first, was what year were we talking this about? This was 1996. Six, okay. So it was in the, like May of 1996, around right. there. 
uh, maybe April because I did, started working there in May. But at any rate, I went and, and I stayed, at, they put me up at the Best Western Motel. Mm -hmm. And there was a lady that was giving a talk, or what I, I know now is called a satsang. Huh. And her name was Gangaji. Oh, Gangaji. She yeah. happened to be there at the time. She happened to be at the, yeah, there at the Very time. Very interesting. And so I didn't know anything about that. I knew nothing about meditation, knew right. nothing about anything. Mm -hmm. And so Gangaji was down there, and I went and I sat down in this satsang. And mm -hmm. it was quite beautiful and quite a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I sat down with everyone, and she was mentioning some things about, she was talking about her opinion of meditators, which was quite lovely, quite nice. Mm -hmm. um, and then she, w then she said, and I don't remember exactly when, but it was almost as if she looked at me and she said, whatever you're looking for, you're it. Ah. And I didn't consider myself really looking for anything, but I got it. Mm. You know, you know how when you yeah. get it? I got it. And I stood up and went out and left. <laughs> right in the middle of the talk? Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then fine, I don't need you. I, so, so I, another thing is Gangaji. I think she's a very wonderful, special woman. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but uh, but I, I left. And then uh, as the week went by, and I as I took the the position with uh, with Stephen and Ed Beckley, I uh, started to hire people to be coaches in this coaching department. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I would I would interview them on the phone because most of the coaching was go going to be done over the phone to people who had purchased their business program and wanted to be coached in it to mm -hmm. success. So I wanted to hear how they were like. Well, there were people from all walks of life, but when I was done with, uh, with hiring them, um, that was, um, they were all meditators. Um, they, they were all transcendental meditators. And had people, already been or they got into it? No, they, were, they, they had already been meditators right, right. for many years. Okay. So that impressed me a lot. Yeah. And so um, the, the first coach that I hired was uh, Christine Clark Johnson. Sure, I know her. Yeah. yeah, and then she asked, so she asked me in the middle of that, or not in the middle of that, but during one of the weeks, the first weeks, she said, um, she knew that I was very impressed by that. She said, would you like to learn to meditate? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, I would. Um, and so, and so I, I learned to meditate, and her husband, Greg Clark Johnson, taught me to meditate. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to a residence course, and um, a couple months after that, and in that residence course, um, they were talking about, um, what you call it, um, Cosmic consciousness. Right. Okay. And now I have to explain this because I have to. You have to all forgive me if this. If I did anything wrong, please forgive me. Yeah, right. you're forgiving my son. <laughs> yeah, really? Okay. Because I didn't know. I was. I thought this was supposed to happen to everybody. I uh -huh. thought. I, I mean, they said this, and and I heard. I thought I heard Maharshi Mahesh Yogi in one of these tapes say, um, "When you do this, and then then you will get. If you do this, you will you will go into this cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I thought I heard." He said that. In, okay. In so many words. Yeah, yeah in so many words. Yeah. That's what I, that's what I was getting out of it. Yeah. And so being at that time still a very strict Mormon, mm -hmm. I prayed about everything. Yeah. And so during this during this. Uh, Residence course. Residence Oh no, I take that back. Excuse me. I'm, oh. Like I said, this is not scripted. Can you tell? Yeah. Okay, I went to that. At that first residence course, I got. Please forgive me. I messed up the whole thing. I got nothing out of that first oh, residence okay. course. Oh, okay. That was okay. the first. Nothing. It was a dud. <laughs> it was a dud. No, it was a wonderful experience. But Maharshi Mahesh was talking about is something called shake hands, shaking hands with God. Oh, remember, I remember that? that okay. That was a good take. And he talks about who God is. Right. Well, being a Mormon, I had a strict view, not a strict view because it's very expanded. View, a well formed view. A well formed view, yeah, right. of who God was. It goes this and 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 He's this and Jesus is the Son and the Holy right. Ghost is the Holy Ghost. Then you know, and Heavenly Mother is Heavenly Mother and all that. So when he was talking about who God is, it kind of went over my head. It went mm -hmm. like that. Now, after, um, after, I, after the thing happened to Ed's, Ed's company with the IRS and the FBI coming yeah. in and, yeah, right, and closing it down. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, it's, uh, I left and then came back and started working for Telegroup. And I also met a wonderful woman named Elaine Bankston. Mm -hmm. And um, I fell in love. We got married. Hmm. Now, at that point, then I went to another uh, a yeah. residence course. Right. Right. I started going to school at MUM. I wanted to finish up my doctorate, so I so I went to MUM to get some classes. And again, I heard the stuff about the, this going into you know, going to uh, another level, or maybe a higher level of consciousness, and so it, it called cosmic consciousness. And so um, I learned about it. And during this residence course, and again, I apologize if I <laughs> if, I, if I did anything wrong here. Nothing but right. I uh, but I prayed uh -huh. and said um, before I, during this residence course before I meditated one of the times I said I want to go into this 
cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. Because I loved it. I loved what it felt like, it sounded like. Right. And I thought, I want this. Mm -hmm. And I had every, what do you call it? I, I knew on the deepest level that yeah. I would. You're just faithful, innocent. Yeah, and, and, I, and, right. I didn't know yeah. that, that there was something like a 20-year waiting period for this. <laughs> cut the line. <laughs> right. I, did, I cut in line. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so I, got, I prayed, and then I started meditating. And during that meditation, I, I went into sort of, I wouldn't say trance, because that sounds weird, but right. it, wasn't really, it wasn't a trance. It was just maybe a dream, maybe whatever it was. It was very profound to me, <clears throat> for me. And it was, I was standing before or inside of a building that looked like a completed version of, uh, of what's that round building in Stonehenge? It looked like sort of a completed, like more of a modern, like completed version. Somebody put a version. roof on it. Yeah, somebody put it. And it was blue and gold. Huh. And there's this blue and gold light. And in there were three men. And they said to me, I don't know if it's a thought that they said or whether they spoke a lot, I, I can't really recall. Mm -hmm. But all I know is that it was communicated to me. And they said these words, we're going to grant you your, your request. Wow. And so, and it was such a deeply profound experience that I, I came out and I and literally it was as if I were walking around and there was someone myself walking behind around behind me huh. as if I were driving the car and I was in the back seat watching myself drive the car too yeah no matter what I did I knew before I was doing it that I was going to do it and yet it was totally spontaneous right and I did and I went around and it was just like whoa I just I, I it was like whoa hold, hold on here and, I, and so I, and then I went to bed that night, and I, um, and I, went, I said, okay, now I'm going to sleep, now I'm asleep, and now I'm still asleep, but I never went to sleep. Right, you're awake. Yeah, and it was just, and I, and, and then that happened, it kept happening for about two, three weeks, and finally I said, um, I, I really, guys, or who, you know, guys, <laughs> please, this is driving me crazy here. So it kind of just settled in a little more. Right. So it's just not that present, but it's been there since then. Yeah. And, and, it's, uh, and, and again, I didn't think it was anything that special, so I never told anybody. Huh. I, the first person I told uh, uh, was Fred Travis at uh -huh. the university. I didn't tell him till I believe, in the Dome last year. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a neurophysiologist. So yeah. Did he hook you up? And no, no, but he, said, but, but he had said something to me. And I don't want to get Fred in trouble for if, he, if, I, if I'm misquoting you, Fred. Please forgive me. Because, but I remember that because I wasn't asking him for this to, to, for him to, you know, Verify. To convince, verify, because yeah. to me it was just, and, and I didn't care whether it was really what it was. I didn't care what the label for it is. It was just the experience was wonderful and beautiful yeah. and profound. But I, but I just kind of asked him. I, uh, he asked. Oh, he asked me this question. He said, "When you go to sleep, uh, he said, when you dream, are you still awake?" In right. that? I said, "Oh yeah." He yeah. said, "Now when you're asleep and there are no dreams, there's just straight flat sleep. Are you awake through that?" I said, "Oh yeah." So that he said, oh, and then he said, then he told me what that was, what, right. he, what he believed that was. And I don't believe, that he, I believe he knows it, because I believe Fred is totally enlightened, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think he's just one of the finest people yeah, I've ever met, mm -hmm. uh, along with Stephen Wynn. <laughs> and so, I, mean, I, I credit Stephen Wynn for, for bringing me here, for, yeah. I credit everything that in my life in a spiritual, of a spiritual nature to Christ, to Joseph Smith, to uh, Deepak Chopra, to Maharshi Mesh Yogi, and to, and to Steve Wynn. Um, just because Steve Wynn brought me here. Yeah. I wouldn't have done it without that. Well, and, we all have you know. our inspirations. Yeah. But again, I don't want to talk that way because it sounds like I did something. And I don't believe that I did something. I don't believe that I've achieved anything. It's just, it's just a wonderful experience yeah. that, uh, that happened. And, and, I, and I cherish the experience. And I'm glad that, that uh, the university, the powers that be, allowed me to have this experience that, uh, of, uh, of, of, of a greater, not a greater, but, you know, a profound, loving experience. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'll tell you something, that's what it is. If, if you've ever been through something like that, it is a feeling of utter, profound joy and love mm -hmm. that you can never get rid of. Yeah. No matter how, uh, but my, we experienced the, the death of, uh, of, uh, of a son, of, uh, of our son, Jack, who's Matt, or Matt, and Eve's, Matt, Eve's, and, and Bethany's brother. Mm -hmm. And even through that was this profound knowledge that, he, number one, he's okay. And he, even beyond that, even if we didn't, well, I would never not believe that, but if I didn't, for some reason, there would still be that profound sense of joy mm. undergirding everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and as you know, it's, it's, I feel it now, I feel it all the time. 
Even if I get angry, even if I, if, even if I get a little depressed, there's always that depression, but there's that over it. Although, yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I've ever been totally depressed in that sense since that, but, uh, but certainly I have had down, ups, uh, you still have the ups and downs, you're a human but being. you still have that. Yeah, you still have the human stuff, <laughs> but you're kind of witnessing it. You're kind of saying, oh, I'm feeling depressed today. Huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that, that kind of, you're not just wallowing in it like, it, like mm -hmm. we used to. Like, you know. Do you so have a sense, it, yeah. um, now, you know, let, let's unpack this a little bit. Okay. So, you know, you had, what year was it when you were on that residence course and you said that prayer and you saw those men and you had that? It was that right after my wife and I were married. So it was the summer that we were, we were married in, in, uh, uh, in uh, May, uh, May 25th of, uh, of uh, 1998. Okay. So it was about 12 was, years ago or so. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and you had this experience. But wouldn't you agree that unlike other experiences you may have had at that time, such as, you know, going to a great restaurant or, you know, breaking your finger or, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. great experience. or, you know, uh, going, seeing a really cool movie or going on a vacation to a really beautiful place or whatever, there's something different in the entire structure of the experience you're referring to in that it wasn't just a thing you perceived that is basically gone and, and is nothing more than a memory once you're no longer perceiving it, but it was a shift in the whole structure of your perception, the whole, the whole, the whole kind of you know, nitty-gritty way in which you experience life. Uh, yes, it changed the. It changed how I looked at everything. It had changed how I looked at Christianity. Mm -hmm. It changed how I looked at Christ. Mm -hmm. um, it changed how I looked at my relationship with Christ, with God, with uh, with uh, with the Mormon Church. I would venture um, to guess that it changed how you looked at walking down the street. I yeah, mean, you know, <laughs> just uh, everyday experience is yeah. is being appreciated well, from I see a, what you're a saying. different yeah, perspective. Yeah, I'm looking at it more of a more like this way, uh, you know, yeah. religiously how, how it changed my. Well, so, uh, certainly, such an yeah. experience can change your understanding of, of metaphysical or religious right. concepts. Right. You know, because and I would say the reason it does so is that it substantiates them. You know, it it, it provides the juice. You know, that's behind all the, the it, it provides the experience which probably a lot of the people who originally articulated those concepts and wrote those books were having themselves, which enabled mm -hmm. them to have to give the give expression to such things. I think the most profound thing that it did mm -hmm. was that it made me, well actually there are two experiences that did that to me. One was this, the other was the death of, of our son. Right. Was he just an infant at the time? Oh no, he was 23. Oh. He was 23. So you, you're, you've been married twice and this was your first? Yes. Yeah, this, okay. my, this is our, our first. Gotcha. Yeah, right, right. Oh yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, so when, when I had this experience with the, with the following myself around, I learned that it is totally me, that I'm totally responsible for my life. Mm. That, uh, that there's, that it, although, it, it, I don't know how to explain this, unless you've been through it, that there's still God, and, and I still am totally devoted to, to that concept of God and to, and to the concept of God that came out of that. Um, but I feel differently about who God is, and right. what he, I feel, you know, and there's nothing I want to share here, but, uh, but it's... Can't if you want. Okay. <laughs> 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 I will if it comes out naturally. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, don't, I don't want to force it. Yeah. Because it's a. But I felt like it was that it, it, it's that I'm going to receive a lot of help, but that it is ultimately me that's doing the helping and that's receiving the help, and that's uh, and I don't know how to explain it, but. Uh, but I still believe that there, there are entities and beings, good, loving beings that are, that are helping me through this life. But ultimately, I believe that they are me. Yeah. Actually, that's sort of, sort of what I was trying to get at by a few minutes ago, but I think you articulated it a lot better, which is that, uh, and, and it also relates to this thing you said about feeling like you're following yourself around and being awake during sleep and so on and so forth. And you know, a person might hear that the first, and if it's the first time they've heard something like that, they may think, "Well, it sounds like he's getting a kind of schizophrenia or some kind of divided right. personality, or you know, you have these people with multiple personalities and so on." But I think you know what you're referring to is not a, a division of your, you know, your relative self into two little pieces. No. It's more like 
there's something much bigger than the little piece that we ordinarily you know, perceive right. ourself as being, and that something bigger had woken up. Yeah. And, uh, and it's not, so it's not like a little thing is following around another little thing. It's more like there's something in the background that's always there, that can't really go anywhere, uh, that, and it's always been there, right. and that is in, a, in the deepest sense what we are. Yeah. And, you know, and most people aren't aware of that, but when you wake up to it, there can be this sense of, you know, wait a minute, my body was sleeping, I was sleeping, I was dreaming, my wife said I was snoring, but I was awake, you know? And so what is that I that was awake? It's that sort of deeper, broader, f f more kind of essential nature of the self, which could not possibly sleep. What would happen to the universe if it slept? Right. <laughs> right. And there's no thinking, not ever did I ever think, oh, I am Vishnu, you know, because, yeah, like yeah. you know, yeah. and that's a little too, I mean, that's like, ultimately, yes, I suppose that's true with all of us, but I am ultimately you and you're ultimately me, but we're different. Right. And that's the way I feel about, about the people helping me. They're obviously different people, but in a sense, it's still, I think they're still allowing me. I think that's the whole, that is the whole science of free will mm. and the science of determinism and free will which I believe I heard Maharshi, or heard someone talk about Maharshi saying, is there free will and is there determinism? And I heard that his answer was something was yes like, or something. yes, or that there's total free will and there's, is, yes, there's total free will and yes, there's total determinism. And I get that. Yeah. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. Because with, but knowing that there's people that are helping me and that I've gone through all the stuff in my life and all these lifetimes and things that have happened that brought me to this point, it seems like it's totally determined. And yet I know that it's totally me, that mm -hmm. I've totally made this choice yeah. to, uh, to be where I am now. Do you think that um, the fact that you're more acutely aware of, uh, you know, some beings or something helping you than, than other people might be. It has to do with your Mormon background, which, as I understand it, Mormons tend to place a fair amount of emphasis on angels and higher beings and so on and so forth. Do you think that made you more kind of open to that? Oh, definitely. That perception? No, there's, like I said, that's, that's why I said that, I, that uh, this journey has been one of, uh, of people, of, of people that I revere as great spiritual teachers, masters, and prophets, mm -hmm. teaching me what the truth is about who we are. Right. And who we are are spiritual beings who are on a path to godhood. Mm -hmm. And by godhood, I don't mean godhood. I mean godhood. I mean just yeah. the, the, on, on a path to, um, to being alive forever in the greatest sense of being alive, which mm -hmm. is having, which is you know, creating worlds and uh, populating worlds and, uh, mm. and being on them again and again and again, um, just uh, and having the joy of, of, uh, of being with, uh, with our loved ones forever and ever, for mm. ever, forever and ever, uh, both, and I mean that Vedically, and I mean that Mormonly, or whatever you say it. Yeah. To me, there is no Mormonism, there is no Ved, there is only what I would consider to be the truth, whatever that is, and wh whatever is revealed to me as time goes on. Yeah, well, that's a very commendable attitude, I mean, considering how you know, locked in so many people are to their particular perspective or their particular tradition or whatever, and, and how people tend to, you know, boost themselves up or perhaps, you know, uh, bolster their confidence by perceiving their thing as the best and everybody else's thing is inferior and, and so on and so forth. I, I mean, you have a very open-minded attitude. I do and I don't. Yeah? I have to be honest. All right. Because, because I'm not... I mean, I'm open to the fact that people are evolving at different rates. Yeah. But I, I have to tell you, and again, please forgive me. Who are you asking for forgiveness? <laughs> I don't know. Just anybody. <laughs> anybody that might be. But, but I, can't, I can't lie. Right. I am utterly, well, I have to tell you another experience. Okay. I have to go to this experience. Yeah. I was asked to come back to MUM. Mm -hmm. to Marshy University of Management. Ma Ma Maharishi Fairfield University Iowa. of Management, Fairfield, Iowa. Right. Um, I was working um, a little bit with Ed Beckley again, and then uh, somewhat with in coaching again back in Utah the last couple of years, and I and, and, and doing quite well. And but I was not happy. Neither was my. And yet we were very happy. Mm -hmm. And Utah is a wonderful place to have our, our, our uh, Elaine's kids were there, or her son was there, um, and, and with his wife and three beautiful children, and it was wonderful being there. But I felt this need to come back to mm. Fairfield. So while I was feeling this, again, upper right thing, I want to go back to Fairfield, I, uh, got, my wife got a call from Vicki Alexander at mm -hmm. the college, 
and she said, and I heard her say to my wife, because I was listening to the, uh, you know, the... Speakerphone? Speak, no, it was, it was a message, uh -huh. listening I to the see, message. I and I said, has John ever considered teaching in the business department here? And I just felt this surge of complete joy at yeah. that thought. And so I sent an email to Vicki, and I said, I'm listening. Uh -huh. So she just sent back and said, well, come out and talk. So I decided, I'd just gotten to cities the year before, Cities meaning the TM City The program. TM Cities, right. yeah, right. I got those about the year before. This was about 2007 when, when mm -hmm. I got that message, or eight, I think, 2008. Anyway, flew out, or drove out, and, um, and uh, interviewed with uh, Kathy Greeny at the college. And during the interview, Kathy said, you know, um, would you like to be Dean of Men? And so I thought, this, I called my wife and I, I said, this feels good. Yeah. So I decided to do that. I came out and uh, it turned out that uh, um, I ended up working with Linwood King, who was the current mm -hmm. Dean of Men, and he and I kind of decided that we'd be Associate Deans of Men and work on it together. Co-Deans. Co-Deans, yeah, co-Deans. <laughs> so, and that has been utter joy to uh -huh. work with him. Yeah, he's, he's another a man guy. of complete spiritual enlightenment. In yeah, America. delightful guy. And so, um, so we did that. I have. This way? This way. You go in? Okay. He wants us to move kind of acting out. Anyway, I have no idea where I'm going with this. Where was I going with this? Uh, you're talking about <laughs> how you got back to Fairfield. This is what happens, you know, writing things down. Right. <laughs> oh, okay, got back to Fairfield, okay. And so, it, somehow, oh, yeah. it somehow pertains to some experience. Oh, right. oh okay. because I was saying about very open minded, you know, my thing's not any better than anybody else's thing. And right. you said, well, I. I, I yeah, we'll just to see where this goes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> see if I can get back on track. Yeah. So, um, come back, get the cities. Or, no, I already had the cities. Come back and 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 I started working as uh, associate dean of men. Right. Um, and then, oh shoot, I got, um, came back. You became associate dean of men. We might edit this sorry. part out. Yeah, we'll, we'll edit this part. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, but we were talking about. Uh, the, the different experiences. Yeah, or, I was saying how I thought it was very commendable that you've been so open-minded because most people get oh, locked into Oh, and I said it wasn't. A, oh, oh, yeah, yeah because, you, you confessed that you maybe weren't as open-minded yeah, okay. as I was giving you credit for. Right, and so, oh, yes. So being there, I, I asked, um, I, uh, I had an interview with Craig Pearson, and I... Mm -hmm. and I um, Craig is vice... He is, he is the, um, I call him the, the on-campus president, but right. he's actually the vice executive president. vice president. Okay, called. And, Old uh, friend of mine. and uh, he works, of course, under the direction of, I believe, Bevan Morris, who is the chairman and president of the, of, I think, the president of the university. Okay. Anyway, I've always really, really respected Craig. And so we had this conversation and, and, and we got to know each other. And I, I told him that I would be willing to do anything that he asked me to do, mm -hmm. whether it was, you know, and I, I won't mention what it was, but just certain things I'd be willing to. You know, not do any more or change my attitude about certain things. Not that I had a bad attitude, but right. I'm, I'm not a movement person, so I wasn't really sure what my attitude should be. <laughs> so I said, whatever you want my attitude to be, I'll be it. And he said, no, no, we like it just the way it is. It's fine. Yeah. Um, and so I, uh, so I was thinking, well, I have to be really straight with this now. I have to be really like on the program now, really on the program. Not, and I was on the program, but I'm here now. I've got to be even more strict in yeah. what I thought. And by on the program, you mean... You know, doing your meditation yeah, 20, uh, regularly yeah, going and so to the on, dome like all everybody the time, does you know. on campus. Well, this experience I had it relates to that. I was driving my car and I was listening to the radio, and I just arrived, and I heard this this man on the radio, and he was talking about spiritual experiences and how that relates to God and how it relates to religion and nature and how it relates to other things, and and. This was, I was resonating so much with this man. I was feeling such a love for this person giving this mm -hmm. that I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I got worried because I thought I was totally giving my, surrendering my spiritual whatever to was this Was this like person. a Christian radio station or something? I don't know. I, at that point, I didn't know what it was okay. I was listening to. Um, but I thought, but this was expanded. It was totally expanded, totally loving, totally, I thought, this is what I believe. I believe all this. Okay, uh -huh. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back and resign <laughs> because this man. I'm going to this man. Whoever, if I found out who he was, I'm going to follow this person. Huh. And so I was all set to go back and uh, and I tell my wife, I'm sorry, honey. We got to leave. We can't, can't work for the university um, because I'm following this person. Well, then I came to find out. I heard him speak again, and and uh, and someone said, I think Linwood King said, I said, who's that person? And he said, that is a man named Raja Ram. Uh-huh, Tony, right. Tony, 
I mean, later, well, that was his original his name. His original yeah. name, yeah. But yeah. I, I knew it was Raja, Raja or something. The whole name is a long one, but, yeah, yeah. but they call him Raja Ram. I said, and I thought, that's who I was listening to. This uh -huh. is the man. And I thought, oh, I don't have to leave the college, thank God. <laughs> because, uh, and, but just uh, in everything that's happened in my life, mm -hmm. whether it be from the words of Christ, the words of Joseph Smith, um, certainly the words of Moses, um, the, the words of Maharshi, mm -hmm. and, now, and these words of Raja Ram. Incidentally, this Raja Ram you're referring to, he's a sort of a spiritual head or leader of the TM movement. And okay. yeah, 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 just so people know what we're talking about. But I totally resonated with that. And what I mean by that, when I say that I'm, I don't resonate with everyone, even, right. even people that I totally respect. Mm -hmm. For example, I absolutely revere and adore Amaji. Mm -hmm. And I, um, Ama, and, uh, and I was invited by some friends to go and see Amaji. Mm -hmm. And I did, and it was a wonderful experience. <clears throat> But when I got the hug, mm -hmm. I, you know, I went forward and got the hug and I thought, and I honestly thought, um, is that all there is? I mean, for me, for, for me I mean, I, right. know for, I, mean, I didn't mm -hmm. think it in any negative or bad way. I just thought, I thought there should be more. Right. And, then, and, and she kind of felt it too, I think, because she goes back and then she hugs me again. Grabbed again, yeah. And it was just one of those things where we kind of thought, where I kind of thought, well, what a wonderful woman. And I totally respect what she is, but my heart goes to... Maharshi, Mahashogi, mm -hmm. I, I, it just does, and to Rajaram. Um, so that's who it goes to, but, but still, at the <coughs> same time, that's why I say I totally get that other people don't have that experience, and that m they may not be drawn to them the way I am. Mm -hmm. I resonate with when they talk. I, I get choked <laughs> up when I hear the, their teachings, I, and, I, and I, totally, I totally get it. I don't even say I believe it. I totally know that what they're talking about is absolute. <coughs> And I mean it beyond the religious sense too. I just mean it's just truth. That's the way. I, so, so when kids come to, so when kids at school come to me and they say like, well, I believe this and I don't want to do that. And I don't think I should do the program. I always come back because of the, what I believe to say, I think you should do the program. Whatever you do afterwards or, or whatever you do in your life from now on, that's your evolution. You, it's, I totally respect where you're coming from. But I also totally believe that Maharshi Mahesh Yogi created something that helps lead people into these experiences mm -hmm. that we're talking about. <clears throat> I believe that with all my heart. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's just the result. Um, mm. You use the word believe a lot. And, uh, yeah, that's you the know, Mormon background. Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. You, know, I mean, <laughs> you have a very religious background. Right, from, yeah. From, yeah. You Sorry know, about that. No, that's all right. From Baptist <laughs> to right. church to Mormon church and, and this and that. And, you know, um, I, I would... I believe all kinds of things myself, yeah. and uh, but I think maybe you and I agree or would agree that um, you know when there's when one's experience of these spiritual truths or realities or whatever we want to call it, one, essentially when one's experience of the self is clear enough, then there's not this sort of uh, dependency on belief or right. clinging to belief or rigidity of belief. Yeah. You, you can kind of be soft about it, yeah. you know? I mean, some people, you know, they, they use belief like a sledgehammer. Right. And, uh, and, you, and I get the sense that people who do that are actually trying to compensate for their own doubt, their own insecurity, right. uh, by foisting their belief on other people with a, with a sort of a, an aggressive, nat well, an aggressive style. Yeah. I'll go out on a limb here, and I'll go off of the belief, and I'll, and I'll, get it, I'll, you know, I'll step into dangerous waters here to talk uh -huh. about. <laughs> I believe that what the great teachers of this world, including Gurudev, Maharshi, um, the other, I don't know the others, I haven't studied the others, that's all, the only ones I've really studied. A whole bunch. A whole bunch. But I believe, let's say Maharshi, that what Maharshi's goal was and is, is to get us to the point where we are our own gurus. Mm -hmm. That's what I sense from that. Yeah. And so, so when I say I, 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 I know, I, I believe that Maharshi's knowledge is supreme, and I do. I also believe that his teaching, the supreme teaching of Maharshi is that we somehow, not, not grow away, but grow away from Maharshi the same way we grow away from our parents. Yeah. We step away, we still love them, we still revere them, we still follow their teachings, but, but this is my enlightenment, this is me. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, if you're 35 years old and you're still living in your, in your you know, boyhood bedroom, there's a problem. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so whatever I'm experiencing, I take full responsibility for it, whether it's right or wrong or whatever. I, 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 I do. At the same time, what I try to teach the kids at the school is that in order to get to that point, 
in my teaching, I don't mean I don't teach them anything, but if it comes up, because I'm, I'm not a teacher of TM, I'm not a governor, but if it comes up in private conversations that we're having, mm -hmm. what I try to get across to them, at least tell them my experience has been, if it were not for Maharshi leading me with these techniques and with these things, with these techniques and with these programs, that um, I wouldn't have had the freedom to mm -hmm. then experience the profound, loving, and joyful experiences that that I had. Yeah. And I'm sure that's probably true with them, with the people that taught them before they came to this knowledge. Mm -hmm. I would say. Well, and also when you think about, I mean, any great spiritual teacher, famous or otherwise in this world, was at one point a student. And, right. you know, and somehow or other, at a certain stage, he underwent or he or she underwent a transition from being a kind of a f someone who is chasing after knowledge and, you know, following a teacher and so on and so forth to having a certain authority, you know, a certain mm -hmm. confidence and uh, ability to teach others and becoming a, a teacher in his own right or her own right. And, uh, you know, so if, if that's happened to all these people who are kind of, who have made a name for themselves, whom we revere, uh, why should it not also happen to us at a certain point? And it doesn't mean that we uh, reject those sources of inf inspiration. In fact, we may appreciate them more than ever but it just means that there's perhaps not the same kind of dependent relationship that there once was. There's, right. You know, there's more of a sense of self-sufficiency, of self-confidence, of, you know, um, like that. I will say this. I said I wasn't going to say who God is to me, but I just, just say in a light sense. Uh -huh. I, I know who God is for me. Uh -huh. I, mean, I mean for me. Right. Like the person that is assigned to me, so to speak. Sort of an individual yeah, sort of um, facet of God that's, yeah, that's on the a, John Spear project. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a, and I think that, and, and the sense that I get is that we have known each other for huh. eternity and that we have played that part for each other back and forth. Mm. So it's like you have a personal God, you're saying, or a personal yeah. kind and of. And he's the God that I call the Father. Mm -hmm. I might call him Christ. I might mm -hmm. call him, well, I call him something. I, I won't reveal that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but there, there's something, and, and it's a. And, it, and it's someone who has been, just to give you an example, Matthew, who is uh, you know, our youngest son, mm -hmm. um, was in the backseat of the car. We're in Utah. We had just come home from church, and we, I was making a turn on this freeway. Mm -hmm. And coming down the road is this huge truck, mm -hmm. huge semi-truck. Um, and, I, and I was just not paying attention, and I turned right in front of it. And it was right bearing down. I mean, it was... Mm -hmm we were going to be killed, or at least Matt was going to be killed, because I, I would have turned and right. would have hit the car right where he was sitting. Um, so I didn't pray, and I didn't have time to pray, right. believe me. It was like, I just, like, whoa, I could just, I just knew that this was going to not come out good. Well, at that moment, I felt a hand on my foot, squeeze my foot, and slam it through the... Accelerator? Accelerator, just slam it through the floorboard, mm. and the car... Huh. jumped and it missed it by just uh, an inch wow and it was just shaking and we were all shaken up but that was to me physical that was a physical manifestation of something anyway hmm. and but things like that uh, from that i'm sure they're happening before that but uh, and i just maybe that's what's the problem with all these toyotas one of these this, this guy has kind of like gone off the program and he's going around <laughs> that's slamming right. down that's right. <laughs> that's right maybe but I mean, that's, that's, been, that's been my experience with it. That is, that is a very practical God. It's not something up there. It's like some of us there all the time. Yeah. But as I've meditated more, done the cities program, and, mm -hmm. and done, that as I've done that, I've gotten this feeling that, uh, and not a feeling, I'm more like a, a ritam, that, mm -hmm. that this is this for me, only for me, speaking only for me, that, that this person is, deeply cares. Yeah. And like I said, it's something that it's almost like he's, it's, and I don't want to say this without, I don't want to, because I, I don't want to get it inaccurate. At the same time, I want to be accurate about the feeling. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if he, because of his relationship with me, he must be there to help me. Hmm. Well, this and, kind of and, sounds and, like the guardian angel idea. Or something you know, like that, yeah. that and, and, I, and I've read a lot of books about that sort yeah. of thing also. And, you know, I guess the, the idea is that we do have somebody looking out for us. And, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And that we also have served that role and will serve that role when we're on, on the other side, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was feeling, that I had this, that I must have had this, that maybe I did the same thing. I don't know. Yeah, don't know. yeah it don't could know. even be some kind of your, some soulmate of yours. There's something that you have a close relationship with. Why? 
But that, that to me wouldn't mean God because I mean there's six billion people on the planet and everybody must have somebody I like, agree. You know. I agree. But to me it's all... But maybe a representative. But it's all part of it. Yeah. Because I, I gave this, um, I shared one experience, like a lot of people share their experience of the dome. One time when I came, first came back, um, I shared this experience. Actually it's before I joined um, the, the university, was when I was just getting the cities and, and going through the dome for a while. And I had this uh, v kind of really profound experience where um, in the dome while flying, where we better unpack some of that. Yeah. I mean, okay, first of all, oh, yeah. unpack, cities. Okay, unpack, cities. There's cities. this TM City program, which we mentioned briefly. It's an advanced program which people who've done, done transcendental meditation for a while can learn. Uh, the dome refers to the, there's two large golden domes or you know geodesic structures on the campus of Marshy University of Management, where everybody comes together and does this meditation and, and TM City program together twice a day. And flying means that there's a component of the TM City program which, is, which they call yogic flying, which was dis discussed by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, which ultimately is said to result in the ability to, to actually levitate, but at the stage that everyone seems to have been experiencing it for the last 30 years, uh, is, might involve hopping or just sort of a short little jumps across the, the floor. During, during practice. But I just wanted to define those terms because all kinds of people will be watching this and if we just throw out terms they won't know what you're talking about. Well, now I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, no, sorry. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, uh, so while doing that, that uh, flying word I call uh, taking off and landing, taking right. off and landing. Yeah. While I was doing that, um, I had this, it was actually during the, one of the rest periods, but I had this profound, um, beautiful experience and it was, uh, it's just for me, and it was that I was at somehow at the beginning of the universe mm. when there was nothing. Mm. And somehow I was there and I was that. I was, you know, I mean, I wasn't, but I mean, I was. I mean, but it was just like, it was at that moment. But I was at the moment of what you call the Big Bang, I guess. Mm. And where everything exploded into existence. The feeling I got from that, before that was that, I'm alone and I want to share with someone, or I, I want mm -hmm. to love. I, that mm -hmm. feeling of wanting to love. And, and, and all of a sudden, with that yearning for, for having someone to love, the universe mm -hmm. was given birth to. In my, in, the, in, the, in my experience, it was as if it had exploded into existence, where, mm -hmm. and where that being that I was, was exploded into existence. At that mm. moment, before that, I didn't exist. But I did, but I did. Right. But I exploded and it was, a, it was an explosion of complete, utter love. Hmm. I am one may I become many. And, 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 I, and, and it was like I was, everything that was creating in the universe, I was the planets, I was the stars, I was whatever it was. I mean, I, I can't even put words to it, but that's, yeah. it just, and it went to the furthest ends of the universe. And the, and the feeling that I got was that I was all of this, and yet I came out of that as the entity, the being, the personality that I am now, mm. and yet I was everything else. Interesting. Uh, this guy that I, was, that I said I was listening to lately, Craig Hamilton, um, the in, great integral awakening mm -hmm. person, uh, has, is writing a book, and I, I heard him give an interesting talk called The Future of God, and one of the points he makes is that we are basically the eyes and ears of the Big Bang, the heart of the Big Bang. It's like this primordial intelligence, which as you beautifully described just now, you know, manifested itself into this universe, ha, you know, has as, as, its, as its expression sense organs, which you, know, you are one and I am one and all of us are, uh, through which it is experiencing the creation that it has created, you know. Right. And, um, like and, we, and we are that yeah, intelligence, right, right. essentially. I, yeah. We may experience ourselves as, and think of ourselves as just being this, this fragment, mm -hmm. you know, this isolated individual in, uh, among billions, but we are more essentially, which you've touched upon a number of times tonight, we are that sort of, I keep holding my hands back like this to imply, you know, fundamental, primordial. Right, right. Uh, we are that uh, primordial intelligence, which is giving rise to all this diversity. And yeah. I, think, I think the experience you just mentioned Kind of touches upon that. Yeah. And, and to me, and for me, that is what I would call the Christ phenomenon. Mm -hmm. People may call Why it something else. Why would you call else. it that? Because 
Um, because I believe that the ultimate definite, the, you know, Christ, there's the Christ story of, you know, of, a, of, a, of a father and a loving mother um, who, uh, who, are, who are both, in a sense, God. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Catholic Virgin of Mary puts her as a very, uh, the, the Virgin Mary puts her as a, as a very unique and goddess almost. Right. And, I, and I, I kind of believe that. And, and then there is his father. And then, and then Christ comes as a result of that beautiful union. But, but that's the story, that's the point value story. Mm -hmm. To me, the cosmic story of that is that, is that the father, so to speak, uh, the, 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 great, the great potential, the great, you know, that this is, I, I, because men to me, we, we, we're, we're about potential. Mm -hmm. And women are about helping men gain that potential, or helping them, helping their families gain that, whatever. Right. There's that nurturing element, there's that reception thing. So, so to me, how the universe was created was that there was that great potential that I would call, in the spiritual sense, the father. Mm -hmm. And the moment that he said in himself, I want to, I want love, I want, I want to love someone, then at that moment, Mother Divine appeared, in a sense, and they came together in that deep, sacred love of where a man says, I want this, the woman says, I will give it to you. And, and then with that came an explosion of bliss and love out of that, and out of that came the creation of the universe, and that universe to me is Christ. Hmm. And that the reason that we say Jesus Christ, well, because to me, he is the a physical and one of the best physical embodiments of the universe in, what, in a physical body. I mean, he who, who lived 2,000 yes. years ago is that, yes. But he's not the only one. Right. But, but, but whoever that was that was Christ, he is also other avatars, other who, who were that universe. Mm -hmm. I believe that the, the first one was Vishnu, mm. that Vishnu is that, that embodiment of the universe, uh, of that great love that became the universe. And I believe that the reason that the Christ story is so important, wh whatever we call it, whether we call it the Christ story or some other story, but the reason Christianity to me is profound is because it teaches me that there is a man that lives as the embodiment of the universe. Mm. And I want to live that way. I want to, I want to do that. Um, I do not believe that I'll go to hell if I don't believe in Christ. <laughs> I don't believe in, you know, I don't believe that, I don't believe that part of the, of the Christian story now. Right. After these experiences, I believe that um, the Holy Spirit is my spirit. Mm -hmm. is, is the, the higher me, is the me that I was exploded into this universe to be. Mm -hmm. the, the personality that the universe made of me. And that I am that part of Christ that is John, and you're the part of Christ that is that is um, Rick. Rick, right, right. I just want to call him Dan for some reason. So, yeah. Other people have wanted to call me Dan too. I know. Maybe I should change funny? my name. You should change your name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so and so I so I. That is my experience. Mm -hmm. That uh, that that I don't believe that Christ is one of these egotists that says you must believe only in me. I don't believe that. Right. I believe that there that, that. I mean, if that if that there. were true, then. Using belief then in most sorry. of the universe is screwed because I mean he he just happened to live two thousand years I ago know. one little tiny planet you know? I know <laughs> God must love to send people to hell <laughs> anyway so uh, one thought that been kicking around my head for the last few minutes that you might like to touch upon is uh, you know God is do you want more water no I'm fine oh, okay I'm just uh, nervous so. okay yeah don't, don't worry it gets oh better. is that water okay. <laughs> uh, God is said to be omniscient right omnipotent. Uh, I'm the present, yeah. all that stuff, uh, and if and that intuitively rings true to me. I mean, if if there is a God, if if, if if you know, if he's anything less than those attributes, then he, uh, you know, wh he wouldn't be able to create the creation as as we know it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but when you think about what those words mean, it means you know, he permeates your tie. He permeates your body. He permeates the wall. Right. Uh, everything. There's no place or, where he cannot it, be found. Or it, perme or it permeates. Or it permeates. Yeah. I, I, once, I once heard Marshy say, the first, first time I ever saw him when I was on a course with him in 1970, he gave this talk in which he said, you know, God is all powerful, is omnipotent, but there's one thing he can't do. He can't take himself out of your heart. You know. Um, that is an incredibly beautiful it's a statement. Yeah. I, that makes me a little choke up. That, uh, that, that is really, and, it, and, and it, again, it resonates with, it resonates with me. That is absolutely the truth. Because mm. I, 
I believe, I say I believe, I shouldn't say that, okay. I, I, I believe. I believe. <laughs> My experience with all this is that we are the only physical evidence of God. What do you mean by that? Uh, or I should say the only personal evidence of God. What do you mean by that? Well, that, that we are all a part of God. Uh -huh. that, 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 that experience that I had of being exploded into, right. into existence, that, that was God exploded. That was, that, that was God as, as, as the Christians would call it Christ, but other religions would call it something else, but eternal love, whatever it is. That, that, that is, that, that, that every one of us is that personal representation of God. Mm -hmm. So Why do you that, use the word only in there? What, what did I say? You said we're the only representative of God or something. Well, because, because, the, um, because there, there, there is no one else. There's only us. Uh -huh. There's only the beings that were created in that thing, whether they're, yeah. whether they're higher beings of what we call gods, or whether they're us, whether they're animals, whether they're whatever the life is. So, life itself so is all God. Of everything is Consciousness is God, yeah. yeah. The expression of consciousness in everyone is the expression of God. So, As so a friend if of I, likes to say, we're sense organs of the infinite. Yeah, so, so if I say, I love you, mm -hmm. God is saying, I love you. Right. No one's going to tell you. God is saying, I love God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, God will say it, but it will be, to me, it will be like when I sing the angels, where mm -hmm. I don't believe there's anything other than that. That's what I meant when right. I said it was God. It, it's the angels, it's you. Yeah. You are, when you're nice, when you help me, it's an angel helping me. Mm -hmm. when, you, when, when, when that guy out there that's helping us helps us, it's God helping us. Well, like Christ said, you know, whatsoever you, you do unto the least of these, you do to me. Exactly, I think that's what he meant. Yeah. And I think Christ, when I say Christ is God, I mean Christ is, certainly in the Mormon Church, Christ is our God. Right. Um, but my expanded belief on that is that Christ meant for us to all be the same thing to each other too, mm -hmm. to be that to each other, to be that savior, to be that loving being to each other and to ourselves. Mm. And, that, and that's what I mean when I say the only emotional expression or physical and personal representation of God in this universe is all of us. Mm -hmm. There's no one else. I mean, there is, but you may think, well, that's God. Well, no, it's another, it's another avatar. It's another person. It's, a, you know, it's, that's, it's who we all are. Marshy had a concept that he often used, which I think takes a lot of the confusion out of this, which is that, there's a couple of thoughts I have here, is that knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. And that, that sorts things out so nicely, because there, you have people running around saying, you know, there is no creation, there is no personal self, you know, and then you have the other people on the other hand saying, you know, there is there is no absolute, there is, you know, it's all relative, and so on and so forth. And, and it's all know, true. And yeah, it's all true. <laughs> it's and all there's true. so many different things people yeah. say, and from the pers from each of those individual perspectives, if if you just totally lock into that, everything else seems to contradict, you know. But but if you have this perspective of, you know, knowledge is different in different states of consciousness. And there's, there's, a, there's a whole theory called spiral dynamics, which is very helpful with this too, which, which is that there are these different memes or just strata of evolution that are represented by different individuals and different, cul like yeah, of different cultures, and mm -hmm. uh, that each is valid and appropriate in its own right. And that people naturally progress from one to the other, generally not by skipping three stages, but by moving stage to stage. And, and, and as I say that, I mean, there are people who, who rail against this progressive notion that there are stages and you have to progress and that evolution is a, is a continuing unfoldment. And they say, you know, all you have to do is you know, realize that this, what you see now is the reality and it's always that way and there's no progression. That too is true, right. but so is the progression thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I love about the, about the, about the well, about my experiences and, and what I've been taught is that it's all you can be in complete and utter joy at any step along the way. Yeah. You don't have to wait to get up to here to feel that. No, you I can like feel that. it here. Yeah. You can be, and, and it's like, and it's, and, it, and to me, it is always about the journey. It will always mm -hmm. be the journey because the journey will never be over. No. Never. It'll always be. I mean, what we're talking about now. I have to tell you one experience that I had with uh, with the Mormon bishop, whom I truly revered. We were doing business together in, in Utah. This is many years ago before I even heard about Maharshi. And, and we were sitting there, and something happened to the business. It was not a very nice thing that happened. It was quite negative, and we were feeling pretty down. We're sitting around a table just like this, and he said to the two of us that were sitting there, you know, someday we will be looking down on this and laughing at it. Mm -hmm. In fact, 
we probably are. <laughs> and I thought, and, and that was another kind of awakening thing, like, like whoa. And I, and I, you know, and, and, and it wasn't until I learned some of the stuff I learned from Maharshi that I understood really what that meant. Mm. And what, and what it meant by, by the, this journey that, that we take and that we're, that we're taking, that at any moment we can, any moment and at all moments, we can feel utter bliss. And this is why I believe that the most important thing that Maharshi has taught, other than the, the techniques and everything, of course, but I mean as far as the, the sermons that he's given, is that one word that he says all the time, which is enjoy. Right. No matter where it is, enjoy. And he doesn't say, well, enjoy after you meditate, enjoy before this, make sure you do this before you can enjoy. No, it's enjoy, the whole thing. Yeah. And, yeah. He used to say that the, the goal is all along the path. You know, the can, goal, and let me say it again, the goal is all along yeah. the path. Yes, he I, called I, it I a royal that. road to fulfillment for that reason, that, that at every stage of the path, the goal is also found. And so there's not this sort of empty and emptiness waiting for the grand glorious conclusion to happen someday. There's fulfillment at every stage. Mm -hmm. And to me that's a very gr kind, of, kind of compassionate feature of life. You know, that whatever stage you're at, there, there can be joy and fulfillment at that stage. And, you know, perhaps if you were to shift back right now to where you were 15 or 20 years ago, it would be an agonizing contrast. But, you know, right. but 15 or 20 years ago, it was okay then. You know, because of the, the contentment structured into your experience at that time. And perhaps if you had been able to shift from where you were 15 years ago to where you are now, you know, the contrast again would be so extreme that you could hardly handle it, you know, perhaps ecstatic. Uh, but, you know, the, I don't know, that makes the point. You know, one thing that, uh, that, I, that you, you get from what you're saying to me, one thing that I, and I don't mean this in a negative sense at all, I just mean that, if, because uh, I never judge people's um, where they are spiritually, or, or I, I just trust that what they tell me is true. But if I were to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I were to say to doubt where they claim to be, mm -hmm. I would doubt it for this reason. I've never had, but if I were, I were to for this reason. If anybody ever says, "Oh, I had this experience and now I've arrived," mm. I would completely doubt their experience because that is not my experience. My experience is not that I've arrived by any stretch. It's that. Oh, this is this has given me perspective on where I am, and and now I can see. Whoa, there's there's so much more, and I like that thing you gave of the spiral because mm -hmm. that's what it's like. You're like here, you're going. Oh, now I'm here. I think I was down here on on my on my own path, mm -hmm. um, and 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 now I'm here. But I can sense that there's something more, and that when I get up here, I'm going to look down at even what we talked about today and say. I knew nothing, right. nothing, yeah. and I can tell, I know that, I know that deep within me, that what we're talking about here, the gods, the other, the higher beings are going, oh geez, you guys don't even have a clue, you know. Yeah, this is, if you Google spiral dynamics, you'll find a lot about it. It was coined, the term was coined by a guy named Claire Graves, and uh, he's, he's dead now, but um, Ken Wilbur and uh, Craig Hamilton, Don Beck, a bunch of people like that are very articulate about it, have written books about it. It's, it's just a nice, interesting theory. One way I like to think of things sometimes is uh, that we're all reflectors. Reflectors. And that there's no end to the polishing. You know, it's like when they make with a Hubble telescope or something, they polish those mirrors endlessly to get them just totally smooth and the right, you know, proportions or the right curvature and so on so the mirror will work perfectly. And, uh, you know, but in, in the, in, you know, they do thousands of hours of this polishing. And in, in our case, the you know, we, we go through a lifetime, lifetimes of continual improvement in our ability to reflect, you know, that which we essentially are. And, and funnily enough, I mean, you know, our essential experience of that which we are uh, is the same now as it was 10 years ago, as it, as it will be right. 10 years from now. It's the same thing. It doesn't change. Right. But our ability to reflect it continually clarifies our ability to express it. Uh, continually clarifies. Yeah. And you know, and something might happen to us. We might have a stroke or something, and then our ability to reflect it won't be so good. But uh, in the bigger picture of things, I don't think that's really a setback. I, thi I think that there's a evo uh, continual evolution to the soul, if you want to call it that, uh, where we become a greater and greater, um, our capacity to embody and to reflect and to express and to bring this into the world uh, continues to grow or be enhanced. One thing that I've noticed that since, since these experiences have been happening is that um, I, I look at people 
more uh, without mood making because you, you could really mood make on this. Uh -huh. So, but but in a hopefully not a mood making way, look at deep into people's eyes, mm -hmm. and you know like, you know, <laughs> and see who they are. Yeah, yeah. And deeply see because they say eyes the eyes are the windows of the soul. Mm -hmm. So it's that you look at the eyes and you see the love you see, and you see yourself. Ah, I was gonna say that if you didn't. Yeah. yeah. Because essentially, you and I are the same person. Yeah. You know, that's what I mean by reflector. You reflect it differently yeah. than I. Right. Uh, and I your kids say, reflect it. Am I handsome? <laughs> We're yeah. all just kind of like. There's a, a nice line I like from the. Remember this band, the Incredible String, String Band from the '60s. Yes. Maybe you were too straight to remember them. I, I was very straight. I was, oh man, was I straight as a kid? But Jeez. there was a line from one of their songs. I think it was Job's Tears was the song, which is, "Light that is one, though the lamps be many." The lights be one. Light, oh, light yeah. that is one, though the lamps be many. Yeah, yeah. And what I what I love about Maharshi about about what what I learned from Maharshi was that what, what we had these birthday parties, you know, mm -hmm. and I love those birthday parties that they have in the in this in this in, in this, I guess it's called a movement. Uh, TM movement. Yeah, TM movement. Yeah. And 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 one of the things they say is that that in something about the light uh, of the world. Uh -huh. And they and they don't mean Maharshi is the light of the world. I, right. I, at first, I thought, and as, a, as, a, as when I first heard that, I was still really strict in my Mormonism. Thought, oh my gosh, in the light of the world, that's Christ, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but but as I heard it, as I listened to it through the years, that no, he's not saying that at all. He's saying something about the light of the world, but he meant consciousness. Yeah, the light, the light of consciousness, the light of the world, that, which is which is which again was my definition of of that. Christ phenomenon. I should remember that little rap because I, I, I sat through so many of those birthday parties. When we were in India on this Vedic studies course, you know, we, we would have, we'd been bussed in from out of town. We'd been there all day. And then it's like 11, 12 at night. Everybody's exhausted. We want to have to be bussed all the way back out to where we're staying. <laughs> Margie, it's my birthday. Oh, <laughs> so somebody comes up, we have to go through this whole rigmarole and they say this little thing and sing this little song. But uh, one of the things I always liked that he used to say was, said, you know, long, long life in immortality to our dear, already enlightened John. Oh, and, yeah. and that phrase, already enlightened, already enlightened. everybody was yeah. thinking, what does he mean already enlightened? Am I already enlightened? I'm not already enlightened. I'm a schmuck. You know, I, don't, yeah. I don't understand anything. But I think he really meant that. It wasn't, he wasn't just buttering people up. No, I, I really believe that, that there's a Vedantic aspect to, to the movement and there's a Vedic aspect. The Vedantic is that you're already enlightened and the, the, the Vedic is that it's a process. It's a continued yeah. process, which I totally believe. Mm -hmm. And I believe that what Maharshi meant when he said it, when I heard that, my interpretation of that, my own, is that, that we are already enlightened, mm -hmm. but we're not necessarily experiencing that enlightenment on the, on, the, on the clearest and most profound right. level we can. And you know, almost everybody who has the kind of awakening that we've been talking about here has this realization, I've already, I've always known this. I've yeah. always been oh, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, why exactly. didn't I see it before? It was right in front of my nose. It's like seeing that picture with the dots on it, and you say, oh, well, why, why didn't I see that before? It's a two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just as, uh, and, and that's why I think discussions like this are very valuable because they, they kind of uh, enliven the understanding, you know. They, they can kind of point to something which has been there all along, uh, which you just might not have recognized. And this town is full of people who have been meditating 20, 30, 40 years, and some of whom still have the attitude that, oh, I'm, I'm decades away from ever getting this, you know. It's, just, it's not going to happen to me. But I contend that it's actually already happened to a good many of them, and if not to all of them. And that there's just some mm. little fog, some little failure to recognize something that has already dawned in their awareness. Mm. But they, they, it's like you're still looking for something which you've already found. And, and you know, I've, I've actually seen people have this moment of awakening where they say, you mean this is it? Oh, this, of course. You know, I've, I've known this all along. I just never, I, I, was, I was looking for something else. I didn't realize it was this. And then mm -hmm. once they gain that insight, there's this kind of you know, rush of confidence and, and uh, yeah. st stability that comes to it. And, 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 and that's why, believe it or not, I feel it's so important that people stay on their programs. Yeah. Because, because when it happens, it'll happen at a different night. They won't be expecting it. And, and, and I believe that there shouldn't be any, what, what I learned was what called mood making. Right. You know, you want it so bad that you start to mood make it. And, and, and my experience with it is, and I'm sure yours and everybody's had it, is that like, like Steve was talking about when he talked about his, it was just a, a simple qu question or a simple 
question he asked himself that put him through that yeah. that experience. And, and anything same, can yeah, trigger it. And the same with me, a simple prayer. Like I, I'm going to do, you know, I think I'll do that. Not expecting that would happen, but yet expecting, I didn't expect it would happen. I just didn't expect that it, I just completely, how do I say the negative of that? I, I had no illusions that it wouldn't happen. Huh. I didn't you were think just that sort of innocent and matter I just, of fact. If it did, I just asked for it. If he's going to give it, fine. If he doesn't, that's fine. But I yeah. totally knew it could happen. Mm -hmm. and, but it just, it just happened. And, and I noticed that some people will do this. They will, they will have an experience, and then they'll spend, they'll go to the dome all the time to regain that experience, yeah. and it's not going to happen. Yeah. It'll never happen the same way again. Mm, good point. It'll happen some other way, and it'll be happen innocently again. It may happen in the dome, it may happen outside of the dome, it may happen in church, it may happen in, a, in the bedroom, yeah. it may happen in a bar, it may <laughs> happen anywhere. Yeah. What is that Christ said, you know, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened. I mean, there's this, this seeking and, and creates a certain momentum, which I think eventually and sometimes very shortly gets fulfilled. Yeah. And this thing about, you know, and this thing about it, it happened and, it, and they, they want it to happen again, they want it to come back. I mean, really, ultimately, what we're talking about is not something which comes and goes or could exactly. come and go. Exactly. That's why I, I started you know, to understand why it's why not an experience. Which if you, you had that experience, it should be still there. Yeah. I, I mean, the essence of it is just joy. The, the experience of the, like my experiences with whatever, with the, you know, the exploding and other thing, whatever, mm -hmm. I mean, that will probably never happen again. But that feeling of unity and of oneness uh, will never leave. Right. Where can it go? Yeah, well, I'm ready. All I have to do is quiet myself a little bit and, whoa. Yeah. It's, it's still and don't there. you even find that sometimes when you're not quiet, sometimes when you're in the middle of, you, uh, you like to, you, you perform in place, which is when right. you're doing something really dynamic like that, there's that silence, you know, there's that, that unity or oneness, as you put it. In, in the midst of this thing where I'm memorizing lines and I'm standing up in front of 500 people and I'm doing all this stuff, still there's this kind of like a continuous flow of... Oh, always. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's the beauty of, I think, of, of being in, in the performing arts is that, is that you have that, cos you have that kind of man-made cosmic consciousness experience where you're witnessing yourself, you know, you know what lines you're going to say and yeah. yet it feels spontaneous when you say it, yet you know you're going to say it. You yeah. have that witnessing factor of, oh, I need to walk over here at the same time you have to have a real relationship with the people on the stage. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you're witnessing the whole thing. Mm. Um, that's why I think theater is such a, and I think theater should be a very important part of Marsh University huh. because of that very And you reason. teach theater there, right? Or no. You, no. No. You just perform in things. But it is, it, but my wife uh, directs and uh, choreographs and, and uh, um, teaches in, for our theater company, I see. along with the children, the kids uh -huh. um, involved in that. And, uh -huh. uh, and we try to put on as many things as we can from Marsh University um, in the Spade Theater, but, we're, but there is no official theater program there at this moment. It used to be the Rodney's friends. Rodney did it for Rodney. MSAE yeah. and for Iowa Theater Company, uh -huh. did a wonderful job. And uh, then Kent Sugg and my wife did it for, mm -hmm. um, for um, the school. So did, uh, so did, of course, Sidney Spade. Who yeah. was well, this whole thing about experiences coming and going, though, let's, let's touch on that and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Okay. Uh, but uh, there was a story about uh, Ramana Maharshi, who uh, was a great saint in South India. It's called Ramana Maharshi? Ramana Maharshi, he was, he was okay. called. And I think I've heard of him. Yeah, he, he was very often considered by many to be one of the greatest sort well, of didn't saints. Didn't Maharshi say something about him? Oh, he, he may have, and he probably, whatever it was, he probably said something good. Very positive, yeah. Yeah, um, highly revered. And um, he was a very simple man. He got enlightened at a young age, and he just basically stayed in one place for the rest of his life, in Arunachala Mountain in, South, in um, Tiruvannamalai in South India, and everybody just started coming to him. Uh, oh, he's but, the one they always see up in the mountain. I said, that must be him. That, that, that must be the... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, in any case, there was, I forget who it was, whether either Papaji or, or Ramesh Balsakar, uh, who were in, teachers in their own right. Uh, Papaji is the one that was... Uh, yeah, he was Gangaji's teacher, teacher and yeah. Andrew Cohen's teacher right. and a bunch of others. Um, okay. Nick, our dog, and a bunch of others. In any case, um, he was having these marvelous experiences where he would see Krishna and he would interact with Krishna and he would wow. play with Krishna and all this. Oh. And... Uh, he, he managed to get an appointment with Ramana Maharshi, which, which was a difficult thing to do because he was now getting who old. who was this that got this appointment? Uh, it was either Papaji or Amesh Balsakar. Okay, okay, he somebody. managed to get this appointment to see yeah. him, uh, and it was a difficult thing to do because the guy was you know, very famous at this point and getting old and not too many people could get close to him and so on and so forth. But it, and, and so the appointment time arrived, and yeah. he hadn't shown up. 
And uh, you know, all the f people around Ra Marsh Robin and Maharshi were sort of buzzing with resentment, like, wh who does this guy think he is? You know, so it's such an insult. He hasn't shown up on time, and it's so hard to get these appointments, and, and so on and so forth. But finally, the guy shows up. And uh, he said, oh, I'm sorry I was late, but I, had, I was playing with Krishna. And Ramana Maharshi said, is he here now? And it kind of like knocked him back on his heels. And, and he had this awakening at that point because he realized that the, the essence of spiritual awakening is not some flashy thing that you might have that you're going to have you know, sporadically. It's something now, 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 all the time. And, uh, yes. and, and anything else that might happen is icing on the cake. But, you know, that sort of perpetual, rock-solid, uh, unperturbable state right. of self-awareness, that's, that's the fort that Maharishi used to talk about when he, when he talked about capturing the fort. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. That is very interesting. Uh -huh. Was he there now? <laughs> what was his answer? You know? I, his answer was he woke up. Oh, his, oh that's what he did. Yeah, that, uh, that was the trigger that, that the, sort of... The ma it, Mahavakya. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> interesting. So anyway, it goes on. It does. Yeah. It does. It goes on. Like I say, it keeps going like this. Yeah. It keeps and it's a great adventure. Yeah. So. So good. This is a good stopping point. Yeah. It's getting hot in here. God. It is. By the way, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you for coming in. Yes. John came in. I called him at noon today or something. I said, the, two, the people I had scheduled, I had a person and a backup person. The person got sick. The backup person drove to Des Moines. Can you come on short notice? And he said, what is it exactly? Oh, it's television? Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> oh, so, oh I have a question for you. Uh -huh. I, mean, I mean, certainly I've had certain experiences. And like I said, I don't claim them to be, I don't claim them to be anything uh -huh. except experiences, what they are, whatever they are, they are. Um, but what made you call me? Because I don't remember. Well, remember. well what made me, I've had you on my list for quite a while mm -hmm. because I, I, you came to this uh, Wednesday night satsang that we have a couple mm -hmm. years ago and right. I heard you speak mm -hmm. and I thought, this guy is genuine uh, mm -hmm. and he's got something going on. And yeah. so I, I put your name down on my list. I've oh, got a whole list of people that I want to oh, interview. Interesting. Good. And I can't wait to hear them. Yeah. For their talk. The, like I said, the most important person to me in this town is Steve Wynn. Yeah. Well, next to my wife, of course, but I mean, her more from a, a romantic and a spiritual and romantic standpoint, but mm -hmm. Steve because because he brought me here and because yeah. I, he's another person I resonate with. Well, I'll so give you I'm a really DVD of uh, of his. Uh, I'd love to see interview. It. Yeah, yeah, do that. Love to see it. All right. Well, thanks, John. Um, so, you've been watching uh, Buddha at the Gas Pump, and. Um, in a minute, the titles will roll, and in those titles, you will see some credits of people that have been very instrumental in helping bring this whole thing about. Uh, one thing you'll see, though, is this little URL of batgap.com, which is the blog that I created um, in order to be a sort of a springboard for all this. All the interviews are archived there in audio format at the moment, some of them in video. Uh, and there are links to other things related to this, such as the YouTube channel, the Facebook group, the Twitter page and also some other groups that I find interesting that are similar in nature, like this Great Integral Awakening that I mentioned, um, Urban Guru Cafe, some other sort of spiritual interview shows that you might enjoy. So uh, check that out, batgap.com. Uh, I've been speaking with John Spear, who is Dean of Men at Marshy University of Management, and it's been a real pleasure, and you know, since we acknowledge that this is an ever-evolving thing, we'll do it again in a year. Or Wonderful. See what's Sounds happened great. then. Yeah. It's been Thank a you for coming in. Thank you. Yeah.